do a lot of filming here in Los Angeles, one thing we do not get a lot of here is rain. And even if we did, there's never a guarantee it's going to rain exactly when you want it to to start filming a scene. So no matter what the forecast is, all filmmakers have to make their own rain. And it's, it's fairly simple. First, all you need is a really big sprinkler system. And then you have to mount that really big sprinkler system high enough in the air that the camera can't see it. And you gotta have a couple of big water tanker trucks out there. Then you turn on your big sprinkler, it shoots the water straight up into the air, and then using the natural and free forces of gravity that we all enjoy every day, it falls back to the earth looking like rain. Now, real rain is normally too small to see on film. So movie rain is always at least twice as big as real rain, just so you can see it. Much better. Uh, and if it's sunny and raining, perhaps you're in a comedy or a romance. If it's dark and raining, maybe you're in a horror movie or a thriller. So weather, again, can go a long way in helping to tell a story. But if you leave these sprinklers on too long, this happens. for our tour, but on your screen you'll see a movie it was used in once. Yeah. Uh, this is called Big Fat Liar, starring Frankie Muniz and Paul Giamatti, and you're about to see Paul Giamatti get, or you're about to see his stunt double get hit by that flood that you just saw. Lady Gaga also uses that flood in her music video for the song Judas, too. Uh, over on your left side next, you're going to see the old Mexico town square that's been featured in movies like The Three Amigos, Nacho Libre, and Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Uh, most recently, it was in the Star Trek series Picard, used as a Romulan resettlement village. Uh, we're heading into the Old West next, though. These are the Old West sets of Six Points, Texas. You're going to see an opera house on your left side. This is the only one that has an inside to it. Everything else out here, just like on the Metro sets earlier, all these buildings are just facades or the fronts of buildings. It's just enough to look good on camera from the outside. Uh, even the bricks are, aren't real. It's all just plastic and fiberglass molding. Everything's temporary and everything can be changed by whatever a production needs it to be. Uh, if you saw Quentin Tarantino's last movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, they used these sets quite a bit in that film, especially that opera house back there. Uh, Harrison Ford was out here doing the movie Call of the Wild for 20th Century Fox and Disney. Uh, they turned this into the Yukon. But the history of the area goes all the way back to the earliest days of the studio. It's called Six Points, Texas, because it used to be six Old West streets that met together right in the middle of town, and during the silent film days, they could be filming six Westerns at the same time on each one of those streets. The first year the studio was open, they made almost 200 Westerns out here. Of course, movies were like 15 minutes long in those days, so you could really crank them out. Uh, today, it can take years to make a movie, from developing the script all the way to finishing it, depending on what's involved. All right, moving on. We're now about halfway through the tour, everybody, so just a quick safety reminder. Stay seated, pull the red cord if anything goes wrong, but so far, so great. I'm proud of most of you. All right, now as we turn here, you're gonna see a little lake on your left. That's called Park Lake, it's a man-made lake. And in 1936, that was the Mississippi River for the musical Showboat. The legendary actor Paul Robeson sang Old Man River right next to that lake. Uh, then in the, get the 1950s, it turned into the Amazon River for one of Universal's big monster movies. That'll be on your screen right now, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. That's what the lake looked like back in 1954. It was the Pacific Ocean for a television show in the 60s called McHale's Navy. And for many years, it was the Red Sea for the studio tour. The water would part and the tram would go through the Red Sea. So. That little lake has played many bodies of water over the years. It's always typecast as water, but that's just your business. All right, we're gonna head into Little Europe next, but as we head down this way, there's gonna be a building with a lot of glass windows at the top you'll see on your left as we turn. That is the Edith Head Costume and Prop Building. Edith Head was a famous costume designer, so that's where they designed the costumes and built them in that building over there. And it also houses thousands and thousands of prop pieces, furniture, pianos, lamps, 
Exhibitions. That's the uh, Universal Rugby team over there. Getting into shape for the new season. Uh, this is Little Europe. That's sand. One of those guys. That would look awesome. Now, most recently, some of the signs you see on the buildings out here are from the last television show that filmed here. Uh, the comedy called The Good Place. Uh, the Good Place takes place in the afterlife, so Little Europe is used as the afterlife in that show. But this area is most famous for being the location of all of the early Universal monster movies. Many an angry villager gathered into the Court of Miracles here on your right side to chase down Dracula or Frankenstein or the Mummy or the Wolf Man or the Bride of Frankenstein. There were many of them and they were all very popular in the 1930s. Uh, during the Great Depression, it looked like the studio was about to go bankrupt, but once they released Dracula, Dracula, it was a huge success, and then Frankenstein came out, it was another major success. So those monster films are what kept Universal Studios alive during the Great Depression. So the studio was a great debt to them. They rebooted all the monster movies in the 1940s again to kind of capitalize on it, and they added Abbott and Costello, the famous comedy duo, to a lot of them. 